I hope everybody's been doing well since our last episode. Today, we're going to be hopping into a case called North Carolina v. Alford. Most of you have probably heard of Alford in terms of the Alford plea, which is what this case gives us. And basically, it's the idea that I say, yes, the government could prove that I did the thing, but I'm not going to actually admit that I did the thing. It's a thing. So do me a favor before we hop into the actual facts of the case, give the video a like, maybe tickle that subscribe button a little bit. It really does help with the algorithm and I always appreciate it. The protagonist of our little tale today is a man named Henry Alford. On December 2nd of 1963, he was indicted in North Carolina on first-degree murder charges. It arose out of a bar fight that occurred when Alford was visiting with a prostitute, and there was a shotgun involved, and the shotgun happened to go off in the direction of a particular individual named Nathaniel Young. Subsequent to said shotgun blast, being directed at Mr. Nathaniel Young, Mr. Young died. Alford was arrested for this, charged again with first-degree murder, and was appointed a court attorney. Now, this attorney went about questioning all but one witness that Alford had indicated to him would substantiate his claims of innocence. The attorney found, however, quite the reverse. And actually, the individuals whose name that Alfred gave him basically all started giving statements indicative of Alfred's guilt. As you can well imagine, the attorney didn't really have a lot they could do with this, and as is appropriate, advised his clients that given the strong evidence of his guilt, it's probably best to go ahead, take the plea bargain of guilty, and throw yourself onto the terms of the court. Alfred agreed, pled guilty to second-degree murder, and that occurred on December 10th, 1963. Now, for those of you that have never been into an American court during a plea hearing, there is usually some statements read of the facts. Some jurisdictions will have testimony. Not every jurisdiction, but a good number of them. And in this case, there were statements and testimonies given. One such set of testimony came from a police officer who indicated that Alfred had taken a gun from his home, stated his intention to kill the victim, and then returned home with a declaration that he actually had done so. Alfred then took the stand and he testified to something interesting. He said that he hadn't committed the murder, but that he was going to go ahead and plead guilty because in his case, first degree murder would draw the possibility of the death penalty. It would be likely to be the sentence he would receive if he didn't plead guilty after his attorney had explained to him the difference between first degree murder and second degree murder. The court then took a reasonable step and asked Alfred, okay, you're telling us you're not guilty of murder. Do you really still want to plead guilty? And he said yes. Okay, okay, that's fine. The court accepted his plea and gave him 30 years in prison. Now we come to the fun stuff. Because Alfred, I guess, decided he didn't want to spend 30 years in prison. And he sought post-conviction relief. And among the other claims he was making while filing that appeal, he claimed fear and coercion were the cause of his guilty plea. On those appeals, the state court, though, found that his plea was willing and knowing and refused his appeal. Around and around he went until he hit the Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals, which actually did reverse his conviction because they said that his plea was involuntary. And when they did so, they were relying on prior case law, which interpreted North Carolina law for the imposition of the death penalty to require such invalidation because the North Carolina statutes encouraged defendants to waive constitutional rights by the promise of no more than life in prison if they did so. Basically, they were arguing North Carolina law coerced individuals into pleading guilty under threat of death. As a result of this, Alfred's primary motivation for pleading guilty was fear, and it should have been rejected 
because it's impermissibly induced by his desire to eliminate the possibility of a death sentence. Basically not that he was actually guilty of the thing for which he was accused. Appeals happen, appeals happen, and we end up at the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court picked this up, took one look at it, and was done with it pretty quickly. They looked at the case law, and they found that previously, where guilty pleas are entered into only to avoid a possible death penalty, there's no compulsion there within the meaning of the Fifth Amendment, and that previous case law created no new test to determine validity for guilty plea. The standard was, and remained as of this case, whether a plea represents a voluntary and intelligent choice among the alternative choices open to the defendant. Where a defendant wouldn't have pled guilty but for the opportunity to limit the possible penalty doesn't in and of itself necessarily demonstrate that said guilty plea wasn't the result of free choice. Now normally when defendants are pleading guilty, a guilty plea is justified by the admission of that defendant that they had committed the crime. But in this case, it's a little bit different. Here, Alfred is pleading guilty without admitting guilt. Alfred is making the positive statement that I did not commit the crime, but the state has provided significant evidence that he did. And the court found that, in effect, Alfred just wanted the dealings between himself and the state to be over. And the plea, his plea of guilty, was one way to have that happen. And at the same time, it mitigates the possible punishment he would face. The court went ahead and took a look at the prior cases, and they did find a split, actually, in the degree of information what was needed to qualify for a guilty plea. They found that in some cases there had to be guilt, and in some, and in some the court refused to force a defense on anyone in effect saying it's your life you can do with it as you see fit there was also a discussion about pleas and punishments when it comes to pleas of no lo contendere or no contest where basically the defendant is saying i'm not going to contest the charges which is not the same as saying i did it and in this instance the court found that there's no constitutional difference between no contest and alfred's statement no! And again, turning now to Alfred himself, the court says that a person might be willing to accept punishment even if he cannot or will not admit to guilt of the act itself. Here, the state had an exceedingly strong case for first-degree murder. And in Alfred's view, he had too much to lose were he to go to trial. In this case, it would be his life and a lot to gain in pleading guilty. And the trial was the last thing that Alfred or his attorney wanted in looking at that calculus. And as a result, in the totality of the situation, the court said that the intelligence of his choice can't really be questioned. In view of the strong factual basis for a plea demonstrated by the state, the trial judge wasn't constitutionally wrong to accept it. So while Alfred might now try to argue that the court shouldn't have let him make that choice to begin with, the state has the option to refuse pleas on lesser included crimes. They haven't, and there's no constitutional implication in doing so. The court did take a moment, though, and expressly say that the prohibitions against involuntary or unintelligent pleas should not be relaxed. That is not the point of their finding here. Likewise, there should not be an exercise in arid logic rendering constitutional guarantees which are counterproductive and put in jeopardy the very human value that we are meant to preserve. In short, free choice. The court, they then find, at the Fourth Circuit level, was wrong to invalidate the plea, and the Supreme Court remanded. So the long and the short of it is the court says, as a free individual with choice, if you want to plead guilty to a crime, even where you say you didn't do it, whatever your reasoning may be, so long as it's not involuntary or unintelligible, we're basically going to let you do it. So that was North Carolina v. Alford. I hope you enjoyed this case. As always, reach out into the comments section down below and let me know what you think. 
Ought an individual who says they did not commit the crime still be able to plead guilty? Yes or no, and why? But until we're together again, I hope everybody's well.